All righty. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming to the Public Sector DC Summit. My name is Sebastian. I will be your room host for today. Some quick housekeeping items. Um, exit is just right behind you. The bathrooms are located down the hall. If you can, please silence your phones to not disturb the presentation. And after the session, if you may, um, please provide your feedback through the app. Um, but with that, um, presenting on continuous diagnostics and mitigation at CloudScale, how federal agencies are modernizing cyber resiliency with the big data platform. Um, please welcome Marper and Stephen Goodman. Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Burr. I'm a senior consultant with AWS Professional Services in the public sector. Uh, primarily, I deal with security risk and compliance migrations and, and automation at scale. So we're going to talk today about CDM, continuous diagnostics and mitigation, and uh, how it interfaces with the, uh, the big data platform. We'll get into this in some detail. First, I'm going to cover CDM as a whole, the mission, the history, very, very briefly, because I assume if you're coming to this session in the first place, you're probably already familiar with it. And then talk something about the data sources that we, uh, we were looking at and how that transitioned into AWS natively, um, how we gathered the, the telemetry inside of AWS, what telemetry even means. And then uh, Steve's going to talk about the big data platform itself and what happens after that data gets ingested. So I wanted to point out a couple things. Yesterday, there was a talk by uh, Darren House. He's an NSA in the, the federal space. And he's doing a lot of work with CDM and, in specific, using AWS Systems Manager to pull a lot of that data. And uh, it already occurred, but I, I recommend that you go look it up on YouTube as it is very relevant. And we will actually be using some of the fruits of that labor f going forward in this program. I also wanted to point out later today, I believe at 1.30, um, Rodney Grilly and Christine Skrenzi will be talking about uh, large-scale cloud migrations. The reason I bring this up is because I'll be talking about a few items that gave rise to the environment that we built and how we do migrations at scale and build out the environments in advance. It's what enabled us to very easily gather all of the logging data and build the patterns that we use to scale out for BDP. Um, first, I want to ask, and I can barely see most of you anyway, uh, how many of you are familiar with CDM? Right, that's most of the audience. How many of you are responsible for implementing CDM programs? All right, much less so. And uh, finally, how many of you are in environments or agencies, DOD, federal or otherwise, that are responsible for CDM across multiple campuses or, or multiple installations? All right, even fewer. Makes sense. So CDM is a program that came out of the Department of Homeland Security, and its goal and its mission was to essentially uh, standardize and operationalize the response to cybersecurity risks and building a program of response and mitigation that would allow for uh, remediating those problems before they grow at scale and, and doing this on an ongoing basis. And that's the continuous component. There are four phases which represent a, a sort of growth over time of implementation and sort of standard setting at scale. And not a lot more needs to be said about this. There is a tremendous amount written about this. There are numerous solutions out there. And one thing I wanted to point out in advance, there are many roads that lead to Rome in this case. This is one path. This is one path that applies specifically to a journey we were on on an engagement that I'll talk a little more about, and how we interfaced with the CDM requirements and how they were unique to this particular customer. So the capabilities for CDM align directly with the idea of what do you have, what's in your environment. This could apply on-prem. It can apply to the cloud. And how do you manage them? You could think of this simply as patching cycles or other things. Uh, uh, CMDBs, change man management databases that give you some awareness and knowledge of uh, what you have and, and how you care for it. It is, it is not uncommon for us to enter agencies as professional services and determine that they don't necessarily have a complete CMDB 
or one that is up to date. In fact, they may have many CMDBs, each of which are not up to date and maintained by, by different organizations. So centralizing and controlling this within one agency is a very obvious driver um, across multiple agencies or perhaps an agency that has multiple sub-agencies or components is even more critical. So there's the, the other uh, element is identities, uh, IAM, identity and access management. Who has access to what? What can they do? Are you exercising least privilege? There are programs behind all of these. Event management, um, I'll pull a little uh, line out of my own history playbook with the idea of incident response and others. And this aligns very directly with cybersecurity risk control. Um, and every security incident is an incident, but not every incident is a security incident. And so if you're collecting a lot of data, how do you determine what's the problem? You know, is it behavioral in nature? Is it an immediate threat? Do you have to correlate at scale to even recognize that it's a threat? And if you do, how do you mitigate against that? And then managing the life cycle. This applies directly to the idea of how do you enable your teams to go remediate a problem that they do find? Maybe it's a simple infrastructure issue. Maybe you just have ports open that need uh, to be closed off. Maybe you need something more comprehensive. Maybe you have boxes that have been compromised and you need to fix that. So CDM is, in addition to a programmatic perspective, it's also a menu of predefined tools and um, tooling that allow agencies and federal and DOD entities, others, those that participate, not everything is called CDM, but there are many programs that sort of align. And it gives them a path to a clear remediation. So, um, in short, I won't spend too much time on this because I think the idea is fairly clear. We need to know what do you have, who has access to it, and really what are they doing? And that's the behavioral element. So it's the assets, it's the users or the people, or even the services in some cases because not all users that access services are in fact uh, users. They could be other services. And then all of the tooling and related uh, um, information that aligns with that. So I'll set the stage here, and I bring this up very specifically because this is how we, we aligned with CDM and why it came to our plate. We were dealing with a, a very large federal agency, a cabinet level agency, that uh, has not only a very large infrastructure, but it's a very distributed infrastructure. Uh, dozens and dozens of sites and sub-agencies uh, in addition to um, um, things that align actually with physical infrastructure on a very large scale for the United States. And so we were asked to come in as a team and help them build out their first real foray into AWS at scale. And we did this in alignment with a methodology we have called migration readiness and planning. And this is uh, usually a 16-week engagement that we do uh, there are partners, qualified partners, that also engage in this. And what we do is build out the landing zone, build out the operational model, build out the security, the people skills org. When, when AWS talks about migrations, we don't just mean migrating a workload or several workloads. We're actually talking about migrating your entire operating model into the cloud. And that's going to butt up against a lot of things. It's really a transformation engagement at scale. So the fundamental byproduct of this is a generalized shared services environment. For years on these stages, you have heard uh, many of my colleagues talking about the landing zone. And there is a standard builder solution available out there that we've had through a few iterations now called landing zone. I think it's up to version 2.03, something along those lines. And uh, it is now being subsequently uh, superseded by a service called Control Tower, which is for which general availability is, is pending. And so the basic paradigm is that you have these various uh, accounts. You separate out your dev test and prod, perhaps a sandbox environment. And then you have your core accounts, which align. And then you have security. We separate out logging distinctly and centralize it, which is very key to the next components that we talk about. The networking elements, this would align with uh, if you have a hybrid environment. And this most definitely is a hybrid environment. Most federal agencies are hybrid environments. So that would be the traditional solution for that would be a transit VPC where you have software routers inside of that VPC that allow connection back through VPNs or connection back through Direct Connect 
to on-prem for uh, shared resources. Shared services, these would be things like Active Directory and others. Um, there are many versions of this paradigm floating out there, and we built them for many federal agencies. But the centralized logging is key because this is where we started learning about BDP and this agency's implementation of the big data platform. Steve's gonna go into the, the real meat of it and the details behind it. Most federal agencies, when they're collecting data, they're doing it in alignment with a set of prescribed sources. We'll go into more detail about those, but they align with things like network dumps, you're getting uh, packet capture, bro, snort, you're getting other things like tenable security, big fix, many things along those lines. So the question for us, and that, that was largely a solved problem for this organization. They have hardware sensors all over the place, they're pulling agents in a variety of areas, but the question comes up, how do we do this in the cloud? Do things change in the cloud? So we looked at all of the native sources we were pulling, and we isolated out those that were of immediate value and aligned directly with what the agency was looking for. So a few specifics, CloudTrail. CloudTrail, these are all API calls, and we are looking at CloudTrail in every account. And it is a best practice to turn on CloudTrail in every region, in every account, even if you aren't using those regions. Uh, I want to preface, this entire environment was built in East-West. There are many federal agencies that build in East-West. And um, most of these are moderate workloads, and that's where the decision was made to deploy. And CloudTrail itself gives you a huge, hugely rich data source. And a lot can be derived about behavior, about who's doing what, what API calls were made, uh, which services or individuals or roles. And um, with that, you can build a, a very complex, very comprehensive response. And we actually build our own services that take advantage of this. Flow logs, VPC flow logs, these apply specifically to the VPCs. And uh, this is uh, traffic inside the VPC, in and out of the VPC. Uh, it's fairly detailed uh, information. It is not equivalent, I would say, to what you're gonna get directly out of a, um, a router dump, if you're looking for that sort of thing directly, but it's not intended to be either. Uh, S3 access logs, these are the buckets, because in this paradigm, in the logging account that we showed you, the only thing that exists in that logging account are S3 buckets. And sometimes we separate out a separate bucket for each logging source to make it easy to audit. Sometimes we just separate uh, all of the logs themselves by account, by type, and all of those can be indexed and parsed. But the access logs give a sort of secondary uh, measure against who's touching what in that data. Config, it's actually one of my favorite AWS services, this is uh, our own lightweight change management database. So if you create an instance, it will be registered in config. Alterations made to that instance will be registered in config. And you can add config rules as well, which when you have deviations over time, that would be essentially a compliant or non-compliant state. And all of this is logged and subsequently ingested. The CLI itself is also logged for BDP purposes. This is a correlation measure so that you can make sure essentially no one gets away with uh, cheating the system. Uh, a lot of the calls that are made in, in CLI when you make those commands are actually reflected in CloudTrail. This is a measure for the actual commands that were issued. So that's what we started with because those are the primary uh, um, raw logs of interest. For other possibilities in future state that we're not actually addressing right now, we're looking at things like guard duty, inspector, uh, systems manager. So guard duty is our uh, security service that runs at the account scale. So you think of it as globalizing security, many agencies call this. It uses CloudTrail, uh, VPC flow logs, and DNS query records to derive uh, signatures, essentially. And there's an AI ML component to it as well, very powerful but itself the findings are, have an intelligence on top of it that was somewhat duplicative of what was being done inside of uh, BDP, so it wasn't an immediate criteria. Inspector is very similar to um, Tenable Security Center or Nessus or vulnerability scanners of that sort. It's a native service 
Again, it wasn't an immediate interest for uh, the proof of concept that we were building. And Systems Manager, similar in a way to Big Fix, although very different in concept because it's very fundamentally integrated with uh, the services. Um, these will be included, and we'll show you the parsing model, and this is the part where AWS Professional Services work together with Enlighten IT to essentially build parsers that align with all of these native data sources, and the model itself is highly scalable, so we could really add any service. We could throw in Macy in there if we wanted to, but this was in alignment with the mission requirements. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve now to talk in a little more depth about um, BDP and its history and what we do with the data once it's ingested. Thank you, Mark, appreciate it. Uh, I'm Steve Goodman, uh, from, here from Enlightened IT Consulting, again, uh, working in close engagement with Mark uh, at the federal customer uh, and really across a number of different uh, federal agencies to deal with the big data challenge in cybersecurity specifically across the government. Uh, big Data Platform is uh, a government-owned solution uh, that we'll get to that in a little bit, uh, but we just sort of want to double tap on some of the CDM challenges and why that program exists and how BDP fits into that CDM challenge. Uh, so really the first thing that we want to cover is, you know, we're here at AWS Public Sector Summit. Everybody wants to go to the cloud. The cloud has tremendous benefits. Uh, and migrations have been ongoing for a number of years at this point. But really, to my awareness, no large federal agency has 100% migrated all of their core business applications, their user identity, their uh, knowledge portals, their customer-facing portals, uh, everything to the cloud at this point. So right now, we, the reality of IT and cybersecurity across the, the federal space is that there are hybrid environments. You have legacy uh, data centers, you have legacy applications that have their own set of monitoring tools, SOPs, uh, SOCs perhaps, and that's just a fact that you have to deal with still in this day and age. Maybe that'll be different in 10 years, but you have to deal with the cybersecurity challenges of today. Part of that is there's a huge variety of uh, network and host data across the entire uh, complex. Uh, so we've listed a number of vendors. There's, uh, you know, for firewall, you can go Palo Alto, Juniper, Microsoft, AWS. Um, you know, there are open source solutions for IDSs, IPSs, uh, and every single one of these things that are deployed out there in your legacy or in your cloud infrastructure everything wants to report in a slightly different format. Uh, there's a host of data formats, and for your cyber defenders at the edge, the people who are working in your SOCs, the people who are doing threat intelligence, your cyber hunters, to be able to, to correlate data from even three disparate systems, that's a full-time job. And in the government, it's not just three, right? You, maybe you have 15 disparate security systems that are all supposed to interoperate, and it's a highly manual process for your analysts to be able to make heads or tails of it and actually configure your devices to secure your networks or identify anomalous behavior. All right. So that's what CDM is, is targeted at, is give federal agencies a, uh, a menu, for lack of a better term, to, to pick, here are the tools that I want to deploy in my environment to help protect my network, my assets, my users, uh, and, and my citizens. So speaking of that uh, heterogeneous network, the hybrid environment, if you look at this network diagram, this is you know, relatively simple, honestly, uh, to have, uh, be able to put it on a single slide, right? I'm sure we've all been into data centers or SOCs where you have the, a printout on the wall that uh, possibly takes up a whole wall showing your routing tables, et cetera. Again, it's very difficult to monitor these things piecemeal between the different aspects of the network, the different aspects of your applications, and the, the different aspects of the underlying infrastructure and operating systems underneath there, and of which there can be vulnerabilities and exploits at all, all seven layers of the, the stack. So, 
we want to be able to deal with that in, in a unified uh, single plane of, of glass, or excuse me, single pane of glass uh, analogy. And then ultimately, uh, when we look at threat intelligence and, and cybersecurity across the federal government, it's really a shared concern, right? That's why DHS has put out the CDM program, is every agency uh, has this issue of needing to uh, secure its IT assets, right? And threat intelligence sharing, uh, indicator of compromise sharing has been a huge initiative across the government uh, for several years because we want to be able to leverage the lessons learned, the best practices, the intel uh, between DOD, between the IC, between the FedCiv sector, so that we're not all working in independent silos and essentially being targeted independently and, and losing uh, essentially the investment across the entire federal government that's been made. Uh, we want to be able to share. So uh, I love this little cartoon, but um, the state of the art is really, it's, it's not easy to share. Um, there's the same problems with uh, changes in formats. Uh, some threat reporting comes out in a PDF, some of it comes out in sticks, some of it comes out in JSON, some of it's in a blog post. Uh, you've got US CERT, you've got a variety of commercial threat intel providers. And being able to even manage and keep track of just your threat intelligence ends up being something of a data management problem. So everyone's probably familiar with the challenges that I'm outlining and go, okay, well, I need a SIM, right? Uh, of which there are many options. So what we've really discovered, and, and the title of this talk is scale, uh, so I'm gonna talk about scale a bunch, is SIMs get really expensive as you start to get up into petabyte scale with these large agencies, right? It works great if you're, you know, one home office and you've, you've got an instance and you're pulling in, you know, 50 megabytes of log data every day, that's gonna work fine and you can go back over 30 days and you say, okay, well, I think we're patched and we're, we're good to go based on what I'm looking at. But when you get into those environments where you've got field offices across the country, across the globe, you think about the DOD, the number of Air Force bases, Army bases, Navy installations across the, the entire world and the network infrastructure, both, uh, <laughs> you know, wired and wireless, the uh, variety of devices that are attached. There's just an unbelievably massive amount of information that's being generated daily, and it's not at the application, it's not at a unified application tier like you might see in, in something like a Facebook or a Google where they control all the interfaces that data is being generated from. So the, the heterogeneous problem is, is really a massive problem. And uh, this is really where the origins of the BDP come into play. So Department of Defense, after evaluating the cost of being able to monitor, you know, a, a hundred different data types across uh, 10,000 different field sites and 10 million different host machines and connected devices, Internet of Things, uh, several years ago said, you know what, we're, we're not going to be able to afford to do this through a commercial vendor. Let's try to, to build our own. And that's what the big data platform is. It's really a, a government-owned, open source, and RMF accredited solution for really large-scale uh, data storage and analysis. So looking at the graphic on the right, you're gonna recognize a lot of open source components uh, that DOD has taken advantage of, uh, both from federal investment, commercial investment, open source investment, to say these are the, the tools that are in play, that are useful, that have been proven to scale uh, from everywhere from data storage, data indexing, message passing, uh, analytics, uh, real-time processing. All of these are components of being able to absorb the data, ingest the data, store it, but store it in a fashion where you can actually get something out in a, a reasonable amount of time so you can action on a cybersecurity concern. And um, DISA, uh, the Defense Information Services Agency, is the, the primary funder of this platform. Uh, they said, okay, take all these tools, 
integrate them into a way that they work together. So that, again, we're not reinventing the wheel uh, for every single uh, organization in the, the US government in terms of how do we handle the cyber data at scale. So talking again about sharing and uh, the joint model, uh, this graphic shows there's been a tremendous amount of investment across uh, a number of DOD agencies as well as some federal and civilian agencies uh, into this joint open source platform that, that is available to anybody with a, uh, a .gov or a .mil email address. Um, if you're a contractor for one of those organizations, you can also request access to this uh, source code for use. And all of these tools over really the last six years, this platform has been built up. So it has uh, its roots in a non-premise system and as uh, AWS and, and uh, the cloud has become so prevalent and provides so much tremendous capability, um, across scalability, on-demand, reserve models, cost, uh, that we've begun to work towards those sources um, and that infrastructure as a service being, being the backbone of, of the BDP. So uh, again, it's a software stack. The BDP is, is not infrastructure, it, it's open source, and uh, that's available to be deployed on, on the AWS infrastructure. So the entire federal community benefits from uh, the, the lessons learned, uh, the tools that have been built in, uh, the user interfaces for managing workflows in terms of uh, collecting data, uh, working it through a, a threat intelligence or cyber kill chain type of analysis, and then uh, actioning it in the you know, perimeter device of, of choice. So. Another uh, diagram showing how some of these pieces are composed into the actual uh, logical layers within the software stack. We really have um, the core model of ingest, store, uh, analyze, and visualize in terms of using these tools. So data acquisition, uh, which we're gonna be talking about the engagement with Mark in a little bit, uh, is really the, the linchpin, the long pole in the tent of any project uh, where you're attempting to get better cyber visibility, any CDM effort, you're always going to encounter. You need to have all of your data brought together in one place so that your analyst can get access to it. And until you have a data acquisition strategy, then you really, you can deploy all the tools in the world, you can have all the, the processes in the world, you can have the best users, uh, the best analysts, you know, the most supportive leadership. If you don't have the data in a place that you can quickly go through it, you really, you, you have nothing, right? The, being able to collect data from all of your different uh, hosts, your network devices, uh, your user accounts is really the key. So jumping over to some of the, uh, the advantages of the, the BDP software in terms of uh, technology as opposed to the, the shared investment and the, uh, the open source nature. Uh, one of the key things is that it's designed from the ground up for, for multi-tenant access. So a lot of uh, organizations in the government are, are federated. Uh, you look at, um, an organization like Department of Health, and there's a whole host of sub-organizations beneath it that uh, you know, have different budget lines but have some, some shared mandates. So BDP being designed for the federal government is built for multi-tenant data access. So every piece of data that comes into the platform is tagged with a, uh, a cell level visibility control, uh, and that's supported by uh, the, the Apache Accumulo engine, uh, which another open source tool that came out of um, the No Such Agency uh, several years ago. Um, so that gives you the power to limit uh, what individuals can see at, at the most granular level in the system, uh, which enables you to offer BDP as a service for multiple organizations um, underneath a single umbrella and uh, limit based on those data visibilities. So to be able to share the, the investment um, and the governance 
of a single set of resources within the cloud, within AWS for multiple organizations, that's, that's a big value add. Secondarily, uh, RMF accreditation. So everyone is probably familiar with, uh, with FedRAMP, uh, with NIST 800-53 uh, uh, control implementations, and BDP has gone through uh, the rigors of all of those assessments and has been accredited by all of the agencies that showed in the, the diagram a few slides back, so across the DOD, the IC, and federal civilian community. So that's tremendously powerful in, I'm sure, at least some of the people in the audience have gone through the pain of trying to get a system uh, authority to operate an ATO and understand the challenges of going through an independent assessment and uh, validating all of the classes of those RMF controls. It can be challenging. Um, having an answer to, do you do PKI? Do you have audit logs? Do you have backups? All the things that make up what the CDM platform is designed to do, you have to implement that in your system for CDM. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a virtuous cycle there in terms of securing um, the tools that you're using to secure your, your business applications. Talked a little bit about uh, the cloud in terms of BDP operating uh, in AWS, taking advantage of uh, EC2, S3, Elastic MapReduce, Lambda, uh, IAM. So BDP is uh, cloud native so that it can run within that infrastructure and you can take advantage of all the, the awesomeness that AWS provides uh, with infrastructure as a service, uh, as well as some of the, the higher level uh, platform as a service and software as a service tools that uh, are available. So cyber analytics, uh, this is really your, your so what. Um, why do you want to collect petabytes of data? Right? Nobody's interested in looking at data on end and not getting any intelligence or any wisdom out of it. Right? So in, in that pyramid of, of uh, data condenses down to information, condenses down to, to knowledge, condenses down to wisdom, the, the goal of analytics is to give me a, a so what. Is there a user that uh, has compromised credentials on my network? Is there uh, some sort of brute force attack? Does it look like I'm being footprinted or reconnaissanced or targeted by spear phishing? Something that our defenders can, can act on in that continuous diagnostic and mitigation aspect. We want to get to mitigation in CDM. That's, a, that's the point of the whole program. So BDP supports that with, with a host of analytics that look for, for known patterns. Um, you know, there's, there's unsophisticated stuff that does statistics, counting, stacking. There's uh, machine learning based ones that are going to look at the, the anomalous behavior on your network, define what anomalous is. So those, those libraries are very valuable uh, to, to that mitigation aspect, the so what of why we're doing all this in the first place. And then finally, being open source, you have to have APIs, you have to integrate. Uh, it is a hybrid world, and no system is going to be a standalone system in this day and age. So having the ability to get data in, in a uh, defined, documented way, data out, results out, is very important to the platform. So I glossed over this a bit before uh, in terms of the, uh, the con ops of, of using the platform. You have to start with data. Uh, we have a, a number of uh, data types listed on the left-hand side of, that you might have encountered uh, in your work at a given agency or in the, the private sector. Things like uh, NetFlow, HTTP proxy, proxies, uh, intrusion pre prevention systems, router logs, switch logs, et cetera, application level things, SQL, uh, SQL database servers, et cetera. So, once we've identified and acquired our data sources, um, this is where we start the process of ingesting them into the BDP, making them available for shared analytics, making them available for, for fast search, uh, and making it visual for your users to take advantage of. So this is really where Mark and I's world started to intersect, uh, was at this point um, the work that was done by the, the AWS team uh, to take those 
migrated applications uh, from the legacy on-premise data center, migrate them up into the AWS cloud following best practices, and be able to generate a bunch of native AWS telemetry, hugely valuable from a CDM standpoint, uh, that that's already at scale, that's ready to go because of the, the underlying uh, AWS infrastructure that, that's in place. And being able to aggregate that all into S3, uh, which is, again, very horizontally scalable, easy to secure, so that you've got your, your IAM controls, you've got access logs on those buckets. That, that's a huge amount of effort uh, to get visibility over all of those applications and assets. And so really in our, our model here, you can see, I'm going to take advantage of this laser pointer because, oh wow, that's all right. <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, you can see you've got big data platform here. And really what Mark's team uh, in AWS taking these business applications and getting the telemetry uh, logged into S3 allows us to use the exact same pattern uh, that we are taking advantage of in the cloud with all of our different field sites and our on-premise sensors. So this is uh, anonymized, just a, a generic diagram, but you can see, okay, we have three different uh, sensors that are generating a, a host of uh, different data types uh, that we discussed, network logs, application logs, user logs, et cetera. And the pattern that we've taken in running BDP in AWS is get everything up in S3 get it into uh, your data lake and be able to store that raw data. So the challenge that you run into when you have uh, all of your data aggregated in S3 is now you want to do something with it, right? You want to be able to search across it. You want to be able to run analytics against it. And so there, there's a bunch of great tools, again, that are AWS native that uh, allow you to do that. There are things like uh, Athena, there's S3 Select, um, it looks like there's something called uh, Lake Formation that will be, uh, it, that's in preview currently. Those solutions are, are awesome. They're gonna face the same challenges that BDP also faces in that you have a whole bunch of different data and different formats coming in at different frequencies, different file sizes, different compression modes, uh, and has a bunch of different IAM roles that you need to be able to segregate who can look at it. So at some point, you need to deal with those problems of access, normalization, multi-tenancy, cost, and scalability. And so BDP is really the, the federal government's solution to those questions. So in this model, uh, once all of the data has been aggregated into S3 in its raw format, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to hit back, go into that first uh, phase of, of the CONOPS and we're going to transform and enrich and store the data in the BDP for uh, analytics and visualization. So this is going to be pretty simple. Uh, again, being open source, uh, the BDP has a, a, a highly parallelized uh, ingest mechanism based on uh, Apache Kafka and uh, Apache Storm to be able to use a uh, essentially EC2 resources in a VPC or uh, AWS EMR to run a data set through a configuration. Every file that, you, that you've gotten or any streaming data that's coming in from uh, uh, a, an external Kafka or some sort of R syslog or open socket will get run through one of these parsers to normalize that data into a format so that the BDP can do cross data source correlation, cross data source search, cross data source tagging. So these parsers are very simplistic. They're written in YAML. Uh, we have a giant library of uh, transformations to uh, you know, do things for better indexing in the platform so that you can uh, reverse strings, for instance, if you want to search by domain names, oftentimes you want to, it's faster to search from your top level backwards and uh, rather than starting with your, your lower host name. Uh, data typing, making sure that if you have an IPv4 or an IPv6 address that's not represented as a string, 
like it would be in a CSV file or a JSON file. You want it to be an IPv4 so that your hunters and your defenders can search by CIDR block notation. Right? So data typing is extremely important in these big data uh, solutions so that you can take advantage of the shortcuts that knowing about your data in terms of its type, its frequency, its distribution uh, can, can provide you for taking advantage of your computation. So this is actually the module that we whipped up for uh, VPC flow logs. Uh, all of the types that Mark uh, described earlier, CloudTrail, S3 access logs, config, CLI, have corresponding parsers. Uh, again, it open source and available for, for use to get that data normalized and make those, uh, give you the availability to search across your on-premise uh, as well as your AWS infrastructure uh, in that CDM mission. So flow logs are straightforward. It's essentially NetFlow. It's a five tuple of IP source, dest, uh, port source, port destination, a byte count, and a few other Amazon specific items. Okay. Again, this is about scale, right? So when we talk about the, the challenges of implementing a CDM program at scale, data acquisition and being able to correlate across so many different data types for uh, finding those who's on the network, what's on the network, and what's happening on the network, and being able to answer those asset management, vulnerability management, uh, intrusion detection, anomalous behavior detection. Uh, this is where the scaling up and providing value of the BDP really comes into play. So this is a screen capture of one instance uh, that you can see all of the different types that are being handled across Bro uh, data that's been wrapped up in a Splunk instance. So you've got uh, Splunk that is wrapping up Windows event logs, it's wrapping up um, proxy logs, et cetera, and those are things that need to be broken apart and parsed to make them searchable. And you can see that uh, pretty quickly going up into the petabyte range, um, for this particular instance, that's on the smaller side for the federal customers. Um, you know, we have some instances that you're collecting, you know, tens of petabytes of data, and that's you know like six months of retention. Okay. So for CDM, really you're looking for for risk management, right? You want to mitigate as much as you can. You want to detect as much as you can, but there's always going to be a break-even point in security, right? Where the, the cost of securing your network really outweighs the, the threat that there's actually going to be an exploit of a given vulnerability, right? So it, our role in, in executing a CDM program is to make it as difficult as, as you can afford to for your adversaries to, to take advantage. And so that's assuming that you're, you're in a targeted solution, that, they, that you are being targeted. And quite frankly, if you're in the government, you're being targeted. I mean, that, that's the, the brass tacks of, of where we are you know, today in 2019. Uh, aside from being targeted, there's all sorts of nasty malware that's floating around on the internet. And if you're running an AWS cloud, you're, you're going to have some things attached to the internet. right? Uh, in, in many designs, and obviously having a good solutions architect that can advise you on <laughs> what not to do in terms of connecting to an internet gateway and making sure you're routing and securing and security grouping correctly is very important. Uh, but this is really where the, the tooling in CDM comes into play is when we talk about what is on the network, right? We're really talking about um, vulnerability management and asset management, right? Uh, and when we talk about uh, things like uh, Tenable Nessus or Rapid7 or any of those vulnerability scanners, uh, threat intelligence reporting, um, things from US CERT, DHS, uh, automated indicator sharing, we're talking about evidence that there is a threat out there that can target these vulnerabilities. So that's really where, where your risk profile uh, comes from. So looking at uh, the BDP library of, of parsers, uh, what we've done in this engagement with AWS is we've uh, expanded the, the BDP libraries to handle uh, AWS resource telemetry, which wasn't uh, available until 
uh, this uh, joint engagement that we were, were on uh, uh, this past 18 months, uh, and being able to plug in those data sets into the exact same access mechanisms, analytic libraries as things like Nessus, things like uh, McAfee ePolicy, uh, host-based security systems, um, Active Directory, uh, AWS IAM, uh, event logs, SAML for finding out about identity on the network, uh, and then being able to actually monitor traffic on your network. Um, that's where we look at uh, VPC flow logs, uh, as well as application logs from HTTP proxies, your DNS servers, your uh, firewalls, um, any sort of IDS that you have. So being able to get all of this into a single user interface application, a single data store, and be able to run your queries and your analytics across that is tremendously powerful. So looking at CDM and BDP together, uh, BDP is really that central hub to, to aggregate all your CDM tooling together so that you can make those risk management decisions based on from one place, what are the vulnerabilities that my CDM sensors are identifying? What are the threats that are, uh, have been identified out there in the environment by other organizations, either that are using the BDP, using AWS security tools, using a, a third party? Um, and then evidence of the threat, right? The actual show me anomalous activity, show me things that uh, are clearly matching a pattern of uh, footprinting or credentials brute forcing or you know some sort of hidden command and control, DNS back channeling, et cetera. Uh, this is where it all comes together to, to provide value, uh, again, at petabyte scale running in the AWS infrastructure. So hoping to wrap it up here so that we can have a couple minutes of questions, uh, if there are any. Uh, but the real takeaway is that from this engagement is the, the hugely powerful advantage of the AWS infrastructure is really easy to observe compared to on-premise stuff. Uh, when we talk about all of the CDM uh, menu of tools, uh, those are, again, independent systems that you have to ATO, that you have to deploy, that you have to accredit. If you get your business applications in AWS migrated, you get to take advantage of uh, five different types of security logs that are just there for you in AWS with very little configuration. Um, and as part of that, uh, FedRAMP uh, control set. Uh, so already accredited for use. So that, that's a tremendous advantage of migrating to the cloud in the first place, uh, and particularly with the goal of continuous diagnostics and mitigation. Uh, BDP, if you're living in that hybrid world, is a great place to be able to have that single pane of glass, a great software stack that, again, is open source and available for the, the federal government uh, to combine the observability of your cloud infrastructure, your on-prem infrastructure in a single environment, and really answer that, what's happening on the network question that, uh, honestly, it is many people's full-time job, right? I mean, everyone in your SOC is just trying to answer that question every day. So the goal is uh, to support continuing migration into the cloud and take advantage of the, those economies of scale that AWS provides, the, uh, the utility, um, the, the managed services, and all that infrastructure as a service wonder that uh, AWS makes, uh, makes so easy to, to acquire for the federal government. So we've got about three and a half minutes left. Uh, so we'll say thank you and open the floor up for any questions that you may have. Uh, yes, sir. I think there is a mic in the aisle there. So, uh, excellent presentation and answered. Thank you. Or some questions <laughs> that I had uh, coming in this new. Um, but I guess. Uh, it kind of made me look at things a little differently because it looks like you're setting up a kind of a CDM in the cloud to address both the cloud and on-prem. And I've been sort of struggling with when we have kind of a CDM structure that uh, expects logs to go into the on-prem and we also have cloud initiatives mm -hmm. and getting those logs to the on-prem or just making a risk accepted choice of just 
having kind of an on-prem CDM and uh, maybe right. a cloud CDM. That's right. my first question is, uh, uh, have, have you, you dealt, dealt with, with that? that, trying to get the cloud to on-prem? Mm -hmm. The second part of my question is just uh, CyberScope, because so, that's like compliance, like getting all this information to DHS. So is your cloud CDM connecting to DHS and satisfying that requirement? Yes. So I, I'll jump in. But uh, my, my 15 second answer to your first question is, yeah, organizations often face that challenge of they want to completely segregate their on-premise from their cloud because it's too hard to understand what's going on in between the two of them, right? And there are all these uh, security controls and policy controls around uh, don't take your on-premise data and put it in the cloud because of security concerns. So that, that's squarely where the BDP software stack is focused, is to mitigate that risk with the cell level security tagging, the FedRAMP compliance for all those security controls, and give executive leaders the confidence that moving your on-prem data into the cloud is more secure than having it on-premise because of the degrees of monitoring that are available through the, the AWS infrastructure. So the BDP software stack is targeted specifically at that program of, of unifying um, your on-premise and your, your AWS. And it runs in AWS itself. Um, on the, uh, the second question, um, I feel like I blanked because I was too busy working on your first question. <laughs> no, and to, to answer your question about the idea of you know, how do you ingest that back into an on-prem solution, we deal with that problem all the time. And if you're pulling this, this data inside of AWS, you still need to solve the deposition problem, the centralization problem, the retrieval of those logs is the open problem. And that's really not much different than what we're describing here in terms of what you go up and grab. Now, the question that often comes up with a lot of our federal customers is, do we do pre-filtering in the cloud? Do we put some of the analytics in the cloud before it gets ingested off? That's an open debate. That really depends on the organization, their sophistication, their staff, excuse me, their staffing, their tooling, all of that. And, and what solutions are made available uh, is really dependent on the contractors they have available. So the first stage is to grab it all, centralize it, make sure it deposits, and that you're doing that in a secure and repeatable fashion. And then what and how you retrieve it is the secondary problem. Yeah, I guess the second question was just related to I, my understanding of CyberScope is that once you get this centralized oh, yes. tool yeah, at right. the department level, it has to go to DHS in some Correct. manner. Yes, yeah, so we are doing that, and we send all of the aggregated reporting up to their Archer dashboard. Yes. All right. So I think we're a we're minute at, over. Mm -hmm. um, so should we just wrap up and yep, say? Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it.